How do you keep doing it? I do my job. You want to believe there's good guys and bad guys. And I'm one of the bad guys. But I give these men respect, Marty. All the way through. I give them real world training for whenever some of them might get out. You can't save the world. Yeah. That's a problem. That was a clip from Clemency, which will be available next Friday, the 17th of July. And I am delighted to say I'm joined by the star of the film, Alfre Woodard. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I am happy to join you. Not as happy as I am, believe me. <laughs> uh, I don't want to get into a competition this early, but uh, <laughs> where are you joining us from today? I'm in Santa Monica at home. I've been at home 21 weeks now. And how has the lockdown been treating you? Have you learned a new skill? Have you learned a language? <laughs> I have the cleanest house you can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> so the film is Clemency. You play a Bernadine Williams. Would you set the scene for our listeners, please? Bernadine Williams is a warden in a maximum security prison with a death row facility. She is very conscientious. She does her job well. And for her, that means uh, keeping the covenant that she has made with these condemned men, that she will see them all the way through the process with dignity. And uh, she has operated that way for probably 15 years. But something happens at the top of where our story begins that throws everything in off balance and it, it starts a spiraling in her consciousness and commitment to her job. There's a prisoner during the main part of the story, Anthony Woods, who either is or is not guilty. And uh, our filmmaker, Chuno Yachuku, says it doesn't matter whether he is or not when people ask whether he's guilty. But we, we take the journey with both of them that a condemned prisoner faces and the, the person who is in charge of their life for the years that they are they're with them. And how did the script land at your feet? And what, what appealed to you about it? it was, did you have an instant reaction? Oh, well, even before I got the script, Bronwyn Cornelius is our producer and she she put Chinoye Chuku and I together and as soon as they said oh we're doing this the film about a death row situation well I am a conscious person and I'm an activist and have been for decades and I'm usually on the other side of the equation in in the question of capital punishment I am signing petitions I am uh, supporting clemency campaigns and attending vigils. So as an actor, you always want to do do something you don't know how to do. I mean, that's one of the, the great benefits is acting, uh, that acting gives. You're in your 80th decade, but you still have to learn something to go to work uh, <laughs> on a picture. And first of all, my ears pricked up when they said a woman warden. I, I hadn't really thought about there being women wardens, and all the ones I've seen, of course, have been the fantasy of what a filmmaker might think of as a warden, and they're usually ogres or sadists. And I just started to think, and a death row warden? What little girl thinks, you know what I want to be when I grow up? A death row warden. It's like, what? Is that child like dismembering frogs? But then when I, in preparing to do this, I just signed on because I knew it was an adventure and I knew it was going to be a rugged adventure. But it was one of those, I like to put myself in, or I feel compelled to put myself in spaces where other people are afraid to go, but we need to hear from those places. And so Chinoya and I took a, a prison tour, a maximum, medium, women and men's prisons in, in Ohio. And what I realized very quickly was that the women I was meeting, they, they were coming from social work or from the mental health profession or, or public administration. So I had a, a steep learning curve, but I had people who were very 
very cooperative and they wanted their story to be told because no one's ever looked at it from that point of view. I'll tell you this right quick. Chinoya got the idea for this script because Troy Davis was executed in Georgia and there was a letter sent to the governor to stay his execution from dozens of uh, wardens and deputy wardens and, and, and death row staff signed on saying not only is we, we need to spare this person's lives. You need to spare our lives because this is what it does to us to take life. It is, and they do, they suffer a PTSD rate that is commiserate to, to troops who have been on multiple deployments in war zones. Wow. So we, we have this, this, this traumatic event at the beginning of the film, uh, which sets Bernadine on a particular path. And there was a really lovely line by... Bernadine's husband, Jonathan, played by Wendell Pierce, is great, isn't he? He's just is it? Oh. always, always great. Um, yes, and he, he describes is. her as living in fragments. Was that your experience uh, talking to the wardens? Well, they didn't seem in fragments when I was with them because they, like I said, they would be women that would be, I'd be in a book club with, or uh, they might go to your church or your, your temple because they are accustomed to dealing with people and trauma, they are the steady hand that, you know, if this kind of thing is going to happen, you want a person with that kind of steadiness to be in charge. And so they talked very matter of factly about the fact of, you know, which marriage they were on, if they were even still in a marriage and how their children felt. I mean, they, I read emotions and I read people because I, uh, I'm observant and I pick up on that and I, and I can feel people's joy and pain in a, in a very acute way. But when they did open up, I, I could read the depth of the, the effect of it, but the words were matter-of-factly stated and they, they were just so grateful that somebody recognized uh, their story, their point of view. So the film, which is be beautifully, beautifully shot, um, seems to get oh, more... Oh, Eric Bronco. Didn't he do a, uh, the a DOP? really... The DOP? Yes. Yeah. Brilliant. It was, the film seems to get more claustrophobic, so visually and for the characters as it goes on, particularly for Bernadine. I just wondered how you were able to keep those incremental changes in mind in terms of performance, given that you know, movies are rarely shot in sequence. How did you keep a kind of tab on where Bernadine was on that journey? You know, the way I work is um, I read a script and if I am, if it organically starts to evoke emotion in me every time my part comes up, I know, okay, this is speaking to me. I'm going to, I'm committing to this. I have a way of slowly layering, say, over a month or two layering how to do it. It's like any piece of music. I have written in because I've worked sections uh, and I won't go into it because <laughs> I'm speaking to an audience of civilians, but <laughs> I mark those pages. I mark it the way you would a piece of music. I mark it the way I would as an athlete because I was both a musician and an athlete growing up. And so I already know where I need to be at what point. So the, all of those things are there. And when it comes time to play, first of all, remembering that you are playing and nothing is locked in. So you, 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 you're bending notes a different way each take. And one of the things, because I am very expressive and very emotional as, an, as a human being, and, and that's why I'm an artist, that turned it into a skill so I can depend on it. But I have to, when you are recreating a human action, finding a person and standing them up, what you want to know is not only how they see the world outside of their eyes, how their, their reasoning pattern, but also their gait, the way they move, the way they breathe and emote. And so I play that knowing it, 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 with this one, it just required a lot more control of playing that music. But, um, you know, that, that's the job. You look, they say scene 19. This is when 
And if you start at C19, you look and say, you've got all the things that you want to remind yourself of, that you've discovered, that, that, that you are throwing in the mix. And then you depend, then you apply that with the words. But we know that in good film, as it is in life, the words happen between the lines. It's not what is said, because in most situations, people don't say what they mean or, or what they want. They don't come out. We, we get what we mm -hmm. need. We communicate a different way. And sometimes a filmmaker is, is confident enough to let that play out, is to watch people, is to have the camera on the person who is not speaking, but who is hearing, who's receiving, because that response is much more honest than whatever they'll say back to the other person. You know I'm taking notes, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, so before uh, the lockdown happened, I was filming something that at some point I'll have to go back to. And I had three days of the kind of intense scenes, those scenes where you're trying to keep a, a pressure cooker lid on your emotions. Mm -hmm. And I was exhausted. I was absolutely exhausted. And I was just wondering how over the length of the filming of this, you know, were you able to drop it when you went home? And if so, how? Oh, yeah. I'm not a method actor at all. I believe we're telling other people's stories, telling somebody else's story. So even when it's emotional, even if it's this intense anger, whatever it is, it is not yours personally. You can be, uh, you can channel that, but I don't believe in bringing in to consciousness anything that has to do with your life to to, to get a, a response that you want, because it'll always not seem very epic on screen. It'll just seem like a personal <laughs> emotion. <laughs> so I'm a strong believer in, again, you come in in the morning, you layer on the makeup, the hair, the whatever, you, you're slowly building. I use music a lot and just dance around. I move, I, I get physically in, into that character and with your your costumer has given you the skin to slide into and you you go there and while you're there the breath first of all is what helps you get to any emotional place you want to be even if it is to just delight or extreme joy the breath is what keeps us alive and keeps us you know it is the flow of, of, of human life and movement. So we have to use, consciously remind ourselves as actors to use that. And so really not holding on to a moment. You know, some people hold on to a moment, they think, I'm gonna stay in, I'm gonna stay gripped like this because I gotta be gripped and in another 14 hours still gripped. <laughs> well, you're just gonna be <laughs> gripped because no person is ever gripped. People are constantly trying to, especially in intense situations, they're trying to let go of it. And people don't try to cry, they try not to cry. Mm -hmm. And that's when, the, you know, that's when the floodgates release and that's when your audience, you let your audience feel that. And so you, you, once you take off all that stuff you put on to be that, then you're yourself, you drop it, you leave it there. You go home, you take a shower, you have a glass of whatever you do. You, nobody wants dad, mom, or, or their bae coming home in a state of whack. Oh, and if so, I came home gripped, my, my kids would just mock me. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I said, Alfred, what's, what's next for you? What, uh, what do we get to see you in next? You know, something really fun. I have, it was supposed to come out in the fall, but I think they pushed it into... 2021, I have a picture called Fatherhood with uh, Kevin Hart. It is fun. Of course, it's funny because he can't help it. It is so touching. It is it's lovely. I've got our film Juanita that is on Netflix now that is great, feel, fabulous movie to watch. We're uh, in the process of, of writing the sequel in the spring as well. Oh, well, wonderful. Lots to look forward to. Lots that I can take notes about and improve. You know what? You style. need no notes. Are you kidding? You have all of the swag, brother, and you know it. <laughs> I'm taking that. I'm taking that. That's the nicest thing that's been said to me. Take it. <laughs> <laughs> Alfred Woodard, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. It's been lovely talking to you. Oh my, it's such a pleasure. Enjoy your family. Thank you. You too. <laughs>